Some people have labeled us as deviant members of society. But who would think that? Hey, Provident Preppers, I'm Jonathan. I'm Kenny. And I'm Kylene, the most deviant of the group, I am sure. <laughs> hey, so today what this video is all about is um, we actually um, got online with Ed Rollinson, who is a professor for a university in New Brunswick, Canada. And we did a presentation and all of his about being deviant members of society because we are preppers. And these are questions that his class asked us to respond to. And so we were just making this video to answer those questions for them, but we thought you might be interested in some of our deviant behavior also. So we will start with the first question from Lauren. She says, it is interesting that religion and faith was mentioned toward the end of this video. And she's referring to the video that we originally created with Professor Rawlinson. Um, I wonder if they see a connection between their prepping lifestyle and their religion. I, I definitely think so. Yes, it is a part of, of, we are Christians and it's a part of religion to help others and to take care of our families. In the Bible, in Timothy, it talks about if you can't take care of your family, then you're worse than the infidel. And that doesn't just mean in good times, that means all the time. We have to be prepared to take good care of our families. Yeah, excellent. And then the next question that she asks is, I want also wonder what kind of challenges they face as they are continuously prepping. What challenges do we face? Kenny, what do you think? What challenges do we face? Well, I have to package all that food storage, so there's that. <laughs> there is that. <laughs> there is that. I, I think overall, I, my response would be, our challenges are a lot less than most people's because we're living a lifestyle that that takes all the, the big hills and the big valleys out and just lets us ride a little more smoothly um, than people who are constantly wondering whether they're going to be able to find food or they're constantly wondering how they're going to deal with this or that. We, we kind of just live a lifestyle that smooths all that out and makes it a lot easier, in my opinion. Yeah, so maybe we should talk a little bit about our lifestyle. Um, we actually try to be really self-reliant and we have... Um, a little bit of land, we have an acre and a half, and we grow a big garden, and we have chickens, and Kenny has bunnies, which we don't eat. They just we don't eat them. They just produce fertilizer for the garden. But um, so when Kenny's talking about she has to package all this stuff, we're constantly preserving different foods, whether it's freeze drying or bottling and eating fresh from the garden. And there's a lot of labor that's required with that. There just is. But um, it's, I think it's a really good lifestyle. I made some delightful jam. Yeah, there yes, we go. Yes, did make delightful <laughs> jam. It was really good. Okay, and then Brianna um, asks, prior to this lecture, my knowledge surrounding preppers was limited to the idea of doomsday preppers. Something yeah. I attribute to media and their role in constructing preppers um, as inherently deviant and at times violent. What do you think can be done to change the narrative in the mainstream media to understanding that prepping can also take the form of adopting a self-reliant lifestyle as mentioned in the lecture through food storage and safety supplies, for examples. As you mentioned, prepping was useful during COVID-19 pandemic when the supply chain shortages left the shelves of the grocery stores bare. However, I do not think the media has acknowledged how beneficial prepping is in various economic, environmental, and health crises. And I think that's exactly right. I think, Brianna, you make some excellent points. Um, a lot of this is spun um, to make us look like we are not only deviant, but Crazy. Um, yeah. You know, I think, and I think you make some great points. There's probably some things that could be done if, you know, if the media would allow to show that prepping actually does have some great benefits. Um, yeah, and you're and you're right. Most of what people see is the doomsday preppers, the people that are stocking up on guns, and they're going to kill anybody that comes to to uh, try and take anything that's theirs. There's there's a whole spectrum of prepping from those people who are probably the the smallest portion to a lot of people who are just trying to do good in the world. They're community-minded, they're helping their neighbors, they're preparing so that in a time of crisis, 
we actually aren't competing with others to get the things that we need. We're allowing others to have those uh, those items. Like you said, sometimes those are very limited. So um, prepping is a great thing and it's a, a good thing that people do. Okay, so one of the things I think we need to understand about the media in general is that sensationalism sells papers, it sells clicks, it sell, it, we want to watch the sensationalism. And so if nobody's going to want to know that the Jones bottled 100 quarts of peaches today, right? That is not news. And so I think that's part of the reason why the media tends to focus on the other side, just because it's more sensational. Um, I think that when it comes to preppers, there's actually much, many fewer um, doomsday type preppers then there are self-reliant, homesteading kind of preppers that are just doing the best they can every day to be a little bit more prepared. One other thing that I like to mention is that our, our forebearers, our grandfathers and our great-grandfathers and mothers, and you know, they were naturally preppers. And that's what we try to engage in is um, they were farmers and they were, they were people and they knew that they had to to prepare because the winter might be hard or they, you know, the harvest not, might not be as good as normal. Um, that was just a natural life for them and that's the lifestyle we've tried to take on. Do you have anything to say about that, Kenny? Nope. <laughs> okay. So, Michaela, what was their first steps into starting this lifestyle? Okay. I and was that, born into this. Yes, she, <laughs> she was, was born, born into, into That this. was her first steps. Um, I guess it probably started with me um, as a young father and kind of waking up one day as part of, you know, a maturing process and realizing that, hey, I'm responsible for my wife and my children. And do I know how to take care of them? Do I have the things that I would need to take care of them if there was a crisis? I mean, there are challenges throughout history. There have always been challenges and there will be in the future. And, you know, it was just that wake up call. And I didn't know where to start. You know, the, the natural thing that comes is, well, we probably need some food. Well, then you need water and you need, and it's a step-by-step -step process. But that's what, what got me started was just this need to make sure I could take care of my family. Okay, good. Thank you. Did you? Oh, yeah, being born was how she started. <laughs> okay, so Bailey, I would ask, what crisis do you think would be best equipped, to, you would be best equipped to survive and why? Also, why is prepping so important and should be something everyone should do, but there are some people who can't even afford the basic needs? Oh, such a good question. Yeah. Um, okay, so what, what crisis are we best equipped to survive? I think anything. almost anything. I think anything. Um, we've tried to, to set ourselves up so that, you know, whatever comes, we can get through it. And it's not that complicated, really. And in a lot of ways, it's a lot less expensive lifestyle, uh, which makes it affordable for, for many people. Yeah. So you look at what your basic needs are, right? When you're talking about surviving a crisis, what are your basic needs? Well, I need water, I need shelter, I need food, and I need fuel. Um, and those pretty much are the four basic things that you really need. And sometimes when we think about surviving a crisis, we think, oh, we need all this mountain of stuff. No. Can you get your basic needs met so that you can survive fairly comfortably until the crisis is over? That can you, you know, are you ready to buy some time until you can get yourself into a different position and be okay? Um, and like Jonathan said, one of the reasons why we are so good at prepping is because we have 11 children and we lived on a very modest income. Um, I was a stay-at-home mom and um, so we only had Jonathan's income to support all those children. And it is so much less expensive when you are purchasing things in bulk like rice and beans and, and all that. Um, sometimes people think of food storage as you're buying all these super expensive number 10 cans of freeze-dried food. And that is, that's only one way to do it, right? We're able to eat much less expensively because we have a big garden and to live off of the basics. And as for whether everybody should do this, yes, we think everyone should. This is, this is a basic um, part of life is taking care of yourself. 
I think we live in a world where a lot of people think that it's the government's job to take care of us, and to some extent they can do that. They can take care of you know a small crisis. They can help out with that. That's part of their job. But but as people, as citizens, it's our responsibility to take care of ourselves to the best that we can. And this should include some preparation for a time that may not be as ideal as and, we would like. And it will look different for everybody, right? Right now, while you're in college, you're not going to have chickens and a huge garden and be bottling things. It's, it's just not practical. Can you have a couple extra cases of food under your bed? Can you have some bottled water or have an emergency plan in place? Yes. So we're not saying that everybody needs to be homesteaders. But in whatever way makes sense for you in your particular situation, um, I think it's a really good idea to be prepared for the challenges that may come. Yeah. Okay, Taya, what kind of backlash have you received as a result of the prepping lifestyle? I think sometimes there's a few eyes that roll. I think most people inherently know inside that this is something they should do. Uh, that they should have some preparations. But, yeah, there's there's a, always going to be a few people that roll their eyes and think that we're crazy, and that's fine. That's okay. It's just, it's just part of it. Okay. They think we're more crazy for having 11 kids than for having food storage, quite frankly. And, okay, all of you two might know that we're preppers, but a lot of our, like, friends and associates actually don't even know what we do for a living, right? And they don't realize the resources that we have. They know that I'm the crazy plant lady and that I have a big garden, but I don't think a lot of people really know that we're preppers. Do you all your friends know you're preppers? We don't talk about it a lot. It never comes up, I guess. So. Yeah. yeah. Would you consider prepping to be a sustainable lifestyle in the long run, say in 10 plus years? Absolutely. Yeah. As we mentioned before, it's really a, a way of living. It's a something that we will do our entire lives. It's just part of how we live. And so, yes, absolutely. And it's not, remember, we're not, we're not just stashing food away and hoarding food. We're living a lifestyle where we're self-sufficient and we're able to produce a lot of our own, right? Yeah. Cool. What kind of skills have you learned in order to benefit your lifestyle that would be considered deviant? Oh. <laughs> As I've thought about that, I'm not sure there's really anything. I mean, you know, part of what we do is we, we try and know first aid. We try to know gardening. We try to um, understand the world around us. Um, we store water. So I guess there's some skills that we've learned on how to store water, how to store food. But as I've thought about it, those really aren't that out of the ordinary. Uh, Maybe for some people they are, but... Yeah, and that, that's part of it, right? Because deviant means that we are not following the norm of society, right? That we're deviating from where the mainstream is going. If you're looking at it that way, absolutely, right? We're, we're deviant because we store water. You know, we're not just relying on what's coming out of the tap. So um, I don't think any of the, the behaviors that we have are bad or harmful at all to society, but they do deviate from the mainstream of society. Yeah. Cool. What kind of supplies would you suggest having in your vehicle to prepare for a disaster on the road? That's a great question. And I think, what, what would you need if, if suddenly your car stopped and you were in the middle of nowhere, what would you need to, to be safe? Uh, some water, probably some food, uh, some way to stay warm because you may be exposed to either heat or or cold, but some way to stay warm in the cold and um, You know What do you do in the heat? It's that's a little bit harder but You gotta make but, sure you have lots of water, but making right, you sure need you have water, water. And, yeah. and some type of shelter from the Sun or right so just some of those basics some first aid you may come across an accident or something where you could help out um, so having some first aid, just some basic things, I think. Light, so that you can be seen, right? So that not only you can see, but if, if you break down at night, you want to be seen on that road. Yeah. Um, and for us, so we have two different ways that we do this. So the kit that I have in the car during the summer is different than the one that we have in there in the wintertime. So in the wintertime, I have hat and gloves for every passenger in that car because who knows if I'm carpooling to some you know, soccer game or, or whatever, 
who I'm actually going to have in that car when I break down. Um, so it's kind of really important to think that through and have it for both. Yeah. Cool. Did you feel prepared for the lockdowns that took place during the peak of the pandemic during lockdown? I think that was, <laughs> that was, that was wonderful for us. It was, um, you know, the peace of mind that comes from just saying, okay, yeah, things are changing. Things are, some bad things are happening, but we're just going to keep doing what we do. We're, we're prepared. We can get through this. But okay, so just before the pandemic, we had done this crazy no shopping challenge where we didn't go to the grocery store to buy any food or go out to eat for 90 days. And there is actually a video, well, a whole playlist. Series, of, yeah. Because we took videos and, and documented the whole thing for all, all three of those painful months. <laughs> um, and so actually when, when it came time and we thought, oh, we can't go to the store. It, it was more comforting because we'd been through this and we had fixed the holes in our preps. We knew what we were missing, right? I knew I was missing the chocolate and couldn't do much about Kenny's ice cream, but, but that's okay. What inspired you to begin the prepping lifestyle? We kind of already talked about that. Yeah, we did. I think we can... Okay. Is there any correlation between the extreme couponing lifestyle and the prepping lifestyle? <laughs> okay, okay, so sort of. Um, I I used to coupon a lot, and but then I found that the things that I was getting when I was um, clipping all those coupons actually weren't as necessary for my family, and that um, I did better when I was stocking up on the basics on sale, and um, I would absolutely use some of the couponing to get some of the other things I needed. But um, I rarely ever coupon now, like rarely because. It's just so inexpensive when we're living the basics that, so yeah. sort of. Oh, oh, questions for Kenny and Ben. Now, Ben's not here. He's at school, so we're going to miss out on him. But Hi. Kenny, do you plan to follow in your parents' footsteps and follow a prepping lifestyle into adulthood? Well, yes and no. I'm not planning on doing a YouTube channel or anything, but I do want to be prepared so that I can take care of my family and myself in case anything ever happens or when it happens. So... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. What do your friends think about the prepping prepping lifestyle? Do you speak with them about prepping? Uh, I don't know. We don't ever talk about it. It just never comes up in natural conversation. So, I guess they don't... Like, they probably know somewhere in their brains that my parents are preppers, so I probably am too. But it doesn't ever come up, so... Okay, so it's funny. <laughs> when, when we had all the kids at home, um, some of the kids' friends, like... Um, Josh would bring the basketball team over afterwards to, to eat at our house because they always knew that I had plenty of food. And they used to call our basement in our other house Walmart. It was really funny. Um, and I when didn't we've, know that. We've transitioned now because it used to be that I had like lots of Doritos and things like that down there. Now we really live more off of just the basics. Um, there's not as much like sugar-coated cold cereal and things back in my couponing days. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Alexandra says or asks, do they ever receive any hate comments on their YouTube channel and how do you respond to or feel about it? Okay, when people say not nice things to you, how would you feel about it? So we have, we have some really, um, we have a fantastic audience and for the most part people are really supportive. But there are some people on there that are incredibly unkind. Um, we actually delete comments that are um, vulgar, um, inappropriate, or um, in some way we feel are just dangerous to leave on there. If they just say that um, you're fat and you're ugly, I totally leave those. Um, because the, the truth is, I should lose some weight, right? Um, but we always respond kindly, right? But one of the things that just, like, it, it just brings tears to my eyes is when somebody will say something really unkind, um, all of a sudden, some of our other um, friends and viewers, they get on there and they totally set that person straight. <laughs> and, and it just makes me, it, it, it's sweet, right? But you're going to have haters no matter where you go. And putting yourself yeah. out there in front of 100,000 people, you're going to annoy people. You're, you just are. Yeah. And so... And that's okay. Yeah. And everyone's entitled to their opinion. And, and we don't want to trample on that. They can have their opinion and we will continue doing our work doing what we do. Yeah, and some people feel that social services should come and take our children away from us. 
I'm so bad. We're doing fine. <laughs> okay. Um, in case of an emergency, should I always have an emergency supply of drinkable water in my home? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Double thumbs up. Yes. We, we always recommend at least uh, two gallons per person per day for two weeks. Uh, that's, you know, you can't always do that right off, but we do recommend certainly having some water because I used to be a water system operator and there were times a line would break um, and we'd have to shut down a portion of the city usually a small portion, but sometimes even larger. Um, yeah, yeah, I think definitely. Well, just yesterday we got a text and an email saying from the city saying, hopefully the water will be back on soon, right? Yeah. Ours wasn't the affected, water but oh. yeah, ours wasn't affected, but other places within our city was. So were. sometimes we just think that these things are always going to be there. We'll always be able to turn on the tap and have water. And sometimes that isn't the case. And you know, there could be crises that would take out our water supply for several days or weeks. So, yeah, absolutely. Sounds like a great plan. Um, how do they feel about their government's capacity for ensuring that people are safe, fed, etc. When, when in an emergency? We kind of talked about this a little bit already. Uh, that There is a mindset amongst many that it's just the government's job to take care of that. And as I said, the government can't do that. They don't have the capacity to take care of everyone. Um, at, nor is it their job to do that. It's certainly their job to step in in, in a crisis and do what they can do, but they can't. They, there's no way that they can accomplish a job of taking care of everyone. Okay, and that being said, it's not the government's job, but it's our job to take care of each other and to reach out to our neighbors and to our family and to do everything that we can within our realm of influence that makes sense to take care of each other when hard times happen. Yeah. Mitchell is wondering about any negative or positive reactions that we've had to being, like, saying that we're preppers. In the army, he had friends joke about when The Walking Dead came out on TV that they were going to stock up for the zombie apocalypse, but that was about all. So he wants to know more about if they've been met with criticism, or if we've been met with criticism, or any negative treatments, or the opposite, met with, like, positive things, etc. I, you know, I think it's really important to say right up front that, um, a good prepper actually doesn't tell everybody in the world that they're prepping. We are not as good of preppers <laughs> as we, we should be because we're sharing it with YouTube, right? We feel like we have this mission where we really want to help people prepare um, for the challenges that we are sure are in our future. Um, so most of the time we're a little bit quieter about um, prepping, right, with our friends and neighbors and things. But um, are there criticism? Absolutely. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. In fact... Yeah. Just Sunday at church, um, I, I went up to one of the sisters there and she said, um, I understand that you guys are into prepping and emergency preparedness. And I said, yeah. She goes, oh, I don't do very much of that. I could really use some help. I'm like, we would be so happy to help you. And she said, no, I mean, when something happens, I'm coming to your house. And it's like, you know, how do you handle um, things like that when people when people aren't willing to take responsibility to th for themselves and yeah we we are very willing to help but quite frankly our resources are limited and if everybody's plan is to come to our house that's, that's not, not a plan yeah. it, it's just not a plan um, you hear all kinds of negative things at, but you also hear positive things where people are saying like you know that makes a lot of sense and it makes more sense now after the pandemic than it did before because people are suddenly realizing oh yeah there might not be toilet paper right and when when everybody was racing for toilet paper we were fine we didn't have to go and be a draw on um, scarce resources because we'd stocked up when there was plenty yeah so there there will always be positive there will always be negative and and the key is we don't really care we just do what we do and unapologetically try and make the world better. Yeah. Megan asks, how did our family first come about this idea? What made us want to start prepping and saving things? I think, I think we, we kind of that. covered that, yeah. yeah. Tiffany asks, since you are not extreme preppers, do you know anyone in your community that is? Yes. <laughs> yeah, there are yeah. definitely some. And, and again, that's not for us. Our lives are too important to, to focus on one thing, you know, m most exclusively. Um, 
there has to be balance. We have so much good that we can do in the world. This is just a little slice of the pie. Yeah, and it's funny because sometimes I'm just like, really? <laughs> really? <laughs> okay, Kate asks, she wants to ask us if all of our children have seen the importance of prepping and taking part in it themselves. They're your children, not mine, but yes. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> and, and to answer that piece, I think, so. I think they see that. I think they know that it's a good thing actually doing it isn't always as easy for them. Yeah, but it's, so when you have a well-stocked pantry and you don't have to run to the store whenever you run out of something or, you know, on a constant basis and there's always something to eat, there's always, there's, there's such peace that comes with that, so. Yeah. Kate says she remembers us talking about our children and grandchildren and how you mentioned this was the wake-up call about not being able to support your family and stuff. And it seems like it would be important to pass the same value of prepping to our children, or your children, to feel secure in providing for their families. Yes! Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I think it's, and that's one of the reasons why we're doing this on YouTube, because it's important to share it with our family, but with our community, right? Because this is a, it's just a beautiful lifestyle, I think. And, and we hope that they will embrace the lifestyle, and not all of them do, and that's fine. Because, you know, we are all free to... To choose and it's okay because and they have beautiful lifestyles too right right we're all just different and and that's okay yeah diversity is wonderful okay she's also wondering about the reactions we've received from other people and sharing our prepping lifestyle and like educating people yeah, on and it. I think we've covered that there's there's going to be some that think we're just stupid and others that <laughs> say you know what way to go yeah Robin asks I would like to know when we first got it or when we, yeah, first got into prepping, <laughs> and if there was any event or situation that influenced your decision. Oh yeah, well, so we have, I think the biggest influence probably um, has been our membership in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and having a prophet of God say, you need to have food storage. There are challenges ahead of you that you are going to really need this for. And so I think that is one of the biggest influencing factors. Um, along with what Jonathan's already said. Yeah. Jessica wants more details on how we are self-reliant. We are self-reliant because we can feed ourselves, we can heat without, we can live without electricity, right? Um, and I, I like if, if all of the outside resources stopped, we have the ability to take care of our basic needs. I would run out of chocolate very quickly. That could be tragic. It, yeah, it could be dangerous. <laughs> um, but, but we are able to take care of our basic needs. But one of the things that we learned in our 90-day um, No Shopping Challenge is the blessing of community. Because one of the things that we couldn't have in it was fresh milk. And quite frankly, I'm not a fan of powdered milk. And um, so Ben contacted one of our neighbors who has a milking cow. And he learned to milk. He went over and milked the cow once a week and traded some fruits and vegetables for it. And I think when we talk about being self-reliant, a lot of times we put too much emphasis on the self piece of it. Being self-reliant actually in means being part of a bigger community, being part of a family or a neighborhood or some type of a system or group of people that together have the skills and the resources for everyone to flourish. Jared asks, how have you found that coronavirus has shifted the public opinion toward preparedness, if at all? Definitely. You see, I think we have wait, seen. You see the, um, the, what is that button? Silver, the silver play, play button? button? <laughs> That's how much it has shifted since, since the pandemic, right? You can see right. the interest. Go ahead. I think, I think we've seen many, many people that have woken up and said, wait a minute, okay, um, I can no longer rely on the government or anyone else to take care of me. There are there are events and things that um, I think have woken people up and people have just, uh, you know, certainly not, not everyone, not by a long ways, but there, there are definitely a lot of people that have said, you know, it's time to, to uh, take more responsibility for our well-being and our ability to be resilient. How are preppers reacting to a shifting opinion and the potential influx of more preparedness aware people I think it's it it brings us more peace because one of the most difficult challenges of being a prepper is understanding that 
Um, we are prepared for ourselves, but there is going to be such a huge amount of people that have needs and we cannot meet those needs without it hurting our family, right? And so I think it's, we're all excited about it, right? Yeah, definitely. The more people who can be more prepared, the better everybody's going to be. Yeah. We are not prepared unless our community's prepared. So uh, the more we can involve people, the more people that can be a part of this, it just makes everything better for everyone. Sydney asks, was there a specific event in our past that made us want to have this type of lifestyle? Yeah, yes. I think we've, yeah, we okay. covered that one. Good. Bianca asks, my question is how I should prepare in case of a medical emergency. What are the best tools and methods she should have in case of minor injuries to heal so that it doesn't advance to worse? So that's a great question, Bianca. Um, and and med there are so many different medical emergencies. One of the things that would have been incredibly valuable for people to have um, when they're getting sick with COVID is a, a simple little oxygen saturation sensor, right? It's a little monitor you just put it on your finger and it tells you um, how much oxygen you have because that, that's a trigger that, that shows when you really need to get into the hospital, when you need more care because sometimes you can feel like you can't breathe but, but you've got plenty of oxygen. And, and so there are there are little tools like that that are really important to prepare with. I mean, there's the normal first aid, but just having very basic things in your um, supply, like like a, being able to figure out what your blood pressure is, right? A blood pressure monitor or a glucose monitor. Um, we have a little otoscope where we can look in ears to see if you have an ear infection and things like that. So we have those basic tools. One of the things that we're really excited about that we haven't been able to have before um, are antibiotics in case you couldn't get antibiotics and there was an emergency. And that's through Jace Medical. Um, Jace is actually spelled J-A-S-E Medical. Um, and they have this, this thing where they've got a physician now who will prescribe the top five antibiotics that you might need during a disaster scenario. Um, and I think it's like 259 if you use the promo code Provident, you'll get 20 bucks off. But having those antibiotics stashed away for an emergency, and we, we strongly recommend you don't use them without consulting a physician. And you can call Jace Medical, um, and they will, will tell you, like it comes with a book of when, when you should use it and things like that. But just having some of those basics, because you can very easily die because of an infection. But if you have antibiotics, it could change all that. Yeah. And just some basic first aid training. I mean, th this is something that I think everyone should try to do. Have some basic first aid and CPR training just so that you can help in any kind of a car accident situation or, you know, whatever kind of situation comes up. I think that's yeah. good knowledge is, is always useful. Oh, and a good medical reference book. And quite frankly, I have several of them. And I've gotten all of them either at garage sales or um, thrift stores, so they haven't costed a lot of money. But being able to say, oh, I have these symptoms, and being able to look it up when you don't have somebody to help you is very valuable. As a side note, couldn't you also have like cute little window pots of like little herbs that help like comfort and stuff? Yes. There okay, so I'm really into alternative healing, so yes, absolutely. Cool. Jade asks, would you allow your children to deviate from a proper lifestyle and how would you react? Oh, certainly. Yeah, they do Some it. of them have. And, so and how, how would you stop them? Kenny, you may not be a prepper. Ooh, how am I going to stop her? <laughs> right? Are you... Yeah, no, I think uh, that's just everybody. We try and train and let them make their own decisions. Yeah. Uh, and, and some of them have gone the whole spectrum. Some I, are following. Yeah. Some are choosing to totally ignore it and that's fine that's cool and sometimes i think we need to understand that like just because this is the lifestyle that we want it doesn't mean that it's the best lifestyle or the lifestyle for everyone and we have these amazing children that are doing amazing things in life that i'm incredibly proud of them um because they don't have to be just like us we're kind of two boring old people. <laughs> we're, we're looking forward to seeing what Kenny is going to do with her life. Was he? Many great things. <laughs> William asks, I would like to ask questions about their methods of rain collection and get a more in-depth look into their way of living. That's a you question. Yeah. Okay. So the, the rain collection, 
to me, that is just an amazing way to have water storage. He's so excited. To be able to, and we're just in the process of, of putting in a large rainwater system. We've had a small rainwater system, but we're putting in two very large tanks. And of course, you have to know if that's legal in, in your area, in our state, you can do it within certain parameters. In other states, you can't do it at all. In other states, they, they welcome it. They want you to, to because that keeps more water from running down and eroding and causing other environmental problems. So, but yeah, knowing, knowing that it's legal, if it's legal, it's a great way to have some way to, to capture and, and you would need to disinfect that water. But yeah, great, great question. Now, what else? I missed the rest of it. Um, a more in-depth look into our way of living, and he wants to know if our family is moving toward a lifestyle that is completely self-sufficient, or if we have interest in making a proper doomsday bunker. Um. Okay, so don't get me wrong, I love modern conveniences. I love flipping on a light switch, I love putting clothes in the washing machine and having them come out clean, and um, I, I am grateful to be part of a, a society with a system that allows me to do this. So. Do I want to be completely self-sufficient? No. No. I, I want to take advantage of the wonderful blessing it is to live in modern times and, and yet be prepared for the different challenges. Um, I think the gardening is one aspect that um, I would like to actually do more of. And the reason why is because I can produce food that is fresher, safer, it's you know completely organic. It only has what I know has been put into that soil. Um, and um, it, it's accessible. When I, when I want something, I can just go right out and get it. I don't have to travel to the store. So, so that piece of it, I, I love. I love being able to grow our own food. Um, but that's as far as I'd take it. And do we have any interest in making a proper doomsday bunker? So we have actually toured many of them because of our um, association with the American Civil Defense Association. And um, there, some of them are totally cool, like, like really cool. And would I like one? Yeah. If money was not an issue, yeah, because they sink, you know, a hundred thousand or more into these. Um, it's a lot of money. But it just hasn't been a priority, and, we've, and financially. We've, yeah, and we've, I think we've looked at all the risks and decided we can, we can take care of things without, without one. one. But if we had one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, and let's talk about. It. So, if I was going to spend a hundred thousand dollars, you know, a hundred hundred twenty thousand dollars on something for prepping, um, I wouldn't do it. A I wouldn't do a bunker. I would actually do a camper van, something that was set up where we could like travel and and be set up to go other places if we needed to that we can use as part of our daily life. But financially, for us, that's just a that's a huge piece. Simon asks. Not to be rude, but could, do you think you could ever see your family being on the show Extreme Cheapskate? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, maybe I, I would be on <laughs> Extreme maybe. Cheapskate. It's true. It's true. Like, he has shoes that have holes in them, and he looks at him and says, these have another 100,000 miles in them. So, <laughs> yes, no. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Um, he was listening to how we grow from our garden and don't make large purchases and mainly only spend money on necessary items and it kind of reminded him of that. Oh, so, okay. we try and live like cheap, but I wouldn't go that far, I guess. I don't know. Fr we're frugal. frugal. Yeah. We're frugal, but you know, when you raise 11 children on one income, um, you know, that's the only way that you, you can get by is to be frugal. So, um, yeah, but I do like to spend money on certain things. I do. <laughs> like I like to spend chocolate. <laughs> Which is here today and gone tomorrow, so it has no value, so he doesn't appreciate that. There's no way we can ever store chocolate because it just seems to disappear. It just, so. It's me. It's me. <laughs> I haven't worked that one out yet. Kira asks, um, if we're treated differently within society and our community because we engage in prepping and if us kids feel we're treated differently at school or around our peers, we don't really talk about it with our friends, I guess, so... It just, and not that you it avoid just, it. It just doesn't come up, it so not really. It just doesn't come up. And I don't... I mean, again, people are going to have their opinions, but I don't feel like we've been treated differently. I think in a lot of ways people respect what we do, and... We're probably treated differently because of the number of children we have or with <laughs> anything me. else, right? Like, 
you guys are just so crazy. Why would you, why would you ever? Because we, we don't have like a boat or, or four by four or anything like fancy. We drive really old cars. Um, silver bullet. So we don't fit into the society that way. And I think, um, we're probably more judged because we don't have the, the fancy things than, than we are because of prepping. Yeah. So thank you so much for asking these questions. I hope, I know this has been really long, but it takes a little while to answer them all. I hope that it has been beneficial. I seriously would encourage you to do whatever makes sense in your situation right here, right now in your life to be a little bit more self-reliant, right? So that you could make sure that your basic needs of um, food, water, shelter, and fuel are met, um, even if something really bad happens. Yeah, thank you for allowing us to visit with you. This has been fun for us, definitely fun for us. Uh, we did this last year and this year, and it's a fun experience. And, you know, again, we would just encourage you to look at this as something that maybe you should do and, and take a few steps. And now for the question of the day. How deviant do you really think we are? Comment <laughs> below. That's a question. <laughs> and thanks for being part of the solution. <laughs>